With AI and agents becoming as popular as they are, it's only a matter of time until we need to get security right. Until we, until we need to create meaningful experiences for users that do not compromise their privacy and sensitive tokens like credit card information and more. In this video, we're going to look at how we do exactly that. Specifically, we're going to look at the ladder of security when working with AI. Let's take a look at this now. This ladder is modeled this way. We'll start at the bottom with transparent applications, and that's just applications that don't really encrypt anything. Most chatbots that we work with these days, honestly. Then we'll look at censorship, where we are very carefully curating what the LLM sees and what it does not see. And we will then take those tokens out of the LLM's view, so to speak. So we encrypt things and decrypt things strategically. Number three is we look at local only. I mean, this is peak security, right? Because um, everything happens on one device. Like you're not leaving the inter you're not leaving to the internet. Everything happens locally. So you're not sharing data with some external model provider like OpenAI or Anthropic. You control all of it. That's still maybe susceptible to some security leaks because whoever has access to the machine on which that's running still has access to the sensitive information. If they can read the memory or the RAM, for example, then they can probably read the secure tokens. And so we'll look finally at the ultimate in security, which is hardware enforced security. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Specifically, let's get started talking about just how you create transparent chatbots and agents with minimal friction. To do that, we look at Langflow, which is, I believe, the actually easiest way to do that. So if we open Langflow, this is Langflow, welcome. We create our first flow, which is a very basic AI agent. Um, so we'll uh, get a chat input right here. We'll just drag that on. A chat output, of course, that's what every agent needs, a way to receive input and share output. And we'll do an agent right here. Our agent will use OpenAI as the language model provider. And what we'll do is we'll just copy and paste my OpenAI API key in here, wire up the chat input and the output and just like that, we have an agent. So we can come to the playground and be like, hi, how are you, right? And with agency, um, the agent responds, great. The problem is this is transparent, meaning anyone with access to our network um, or our device or our browser can read these values, say a Chrome extension or some client side JavaScript. Um, but not only is that dangerous, we're actually sending text to OpenAI here and OpenAI, we don't know what happens with our data in OpenAI. Will they use it to train a new model? Will our data surface when somebody else asks a question? Um, we just don't know. So whatever the model sees typically can be reused in whatever way the vendor of the model chooses and the vendor may choose to resurface that for other users or similar. So imagine putting your credit card in here and somebody else getting that number. That's very realistic. So how can we remedy this? Well, uh, for starters, we can use censorship according to our diagram right here. Uh, we can strategically encrypt and decrypt secure tokens. How might we do that? Well, let's look at this in code because code is a great way to reason about security. So uh, let's switch over to cursor right here. And we've got an application uh, that isn't written. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the Vercel AI SDK to create an agent that buys stuff for the credit card. And then we're gonna look at how to do this securely, okay? Don't worry, we're not gonna actually buy stuff with a credit card. We're just, everything is simulated. So to start with, uh, let's import gener generate text from AI and open AI from the SDK. What's the capital of France? And we'll console log the result text. This looks pretty straightforward. So we'll run that in our terminal and the capital of France is Paris. Fantastic, so far, so good. Uh, but of course we want to buy stuff with a credit card. So let's maybe give this agent two tools, um, get credit cards and then buy stuff, okay? So we'll create a tool, uh, actually, Let's change our prompt first. Get the credit card for user ID 123 and buy product ID 456 with it. That looks good. Let's give it some tools to do that. So we'll give it the get credit card tool and we'll give it the buy product tool and we'll close out everything. Let's fix our Zod import just like this. And so now we have two tools. We can say use this tool to get the credit card for user. Use this tool to buy a product with a credit card. The schemas look good. Let's use 4.0, it's a bit smarter. Okay, and so this looks pretty great. Let's implement these. So to get a credit card, we're going to fetch from our credit card service. This can be in your production application, whatever it may be. It could even be Stripe or whatever it is you're using. Um, we get the card and serialize the JSON, but we this anything we return here, we return to the LLM provider. So we wanna be very, very sensitive of not returning just raw card information here. So we're not going to do that. I'm just gonna say no for now. 
And I want to console log this. So we'll console log the card data and we'll actually add another console log getting card data. And we'll tell this SDK that we want to take many steps, a thousand steps. What that means is call tools yourself without prompting the user. Just if there's a tool available, use that. And then finally, we'll on step finish, we'll console log with the tool results or with just, you know, step dot text and maybe tool results as well. Okay. So now this looks good. Um, let's just save this and see what happens. So now we'll run it. Uh, and let's take a look. So getting credit card for user one, two, three card data is actually, you know, lesson K expires in 2026. This looks somewhat valid. Step finished. It seems that I'm unable to retrieve card information. That's fine. That's fine. Um, but we do not want the LLM to see this. This card data comes from our application code console log. This is ours. We're not giving this to the LLM. It's still secure. Before we give this to the LLM, we need to encrypt it. Um, how might we do that? Well, let's talk a little bit about cryptography. You usually think about a lockbox. You need a key, you need a lock, and, and a lockbox is the encrypted thing. There's the encrypted details, okay? So we need a key. Let's start by creating a key. Um, and you may create a key, you may store the key however you want. That's not the focus of this video. We're going to call create key. Create key is a call to crypto, which is a built-in global in Node.js. Always lean on your runtime or a standard library or an open source library. Do not roll your own crypto. Uh, the whole point crypto even works is because it's usually public and standardized and reviewed by experts. You are not experts, okay? You never want to roll your own crypto. So we're going to use crypto.subtle. We're going to generate a key. It's going to be a symmetric key. So AESGCM, a symmetric key means um, it can be used by me. I own the key and I can use it to encrypt and decrypt. Um, it, it's usually good if you are the only one who cares about access to the data. If you want other people to access the data, maybe use an asymmetric key where you can encrypt with a public key, but you can only decrypt with a private key. Um, in this case, we're using a symmetric key, which means we can both encrypt and decrypt with it. Um, this key is also extractable and indeed it can encrypt and decrypt. Okay, so we create the key and that's the key we're going to be using to censor stuff. And so let's, we have the key now. Before we give this to the LLM, let's encrypt it. So what we're going to do is encrypted card and we're going to call encrypt, which is our function. We're going to JSON stringify the card data with our key. Okay, what does encrypt do? Again, we're not, we're not rolling our own. We never roll our own. Okay, so encrypt we get a text encoder to take the text that is the card information and encode it into an array of bytes. Cryptography works with bytes, not strings. Strings are for humans, bytes are for machines, okay? And so we create an IV or an initialization vector. Uh, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a vector, list of numbers, that is used to both initialize the encryption and decryption process. An IV has to be random for every, every single operation and you should never encrypt the same data with the same IV. It's just less secure. So we're literally randomly creating a new get random values from a 12 byte array, a completely random IV here. And then we're going to call crypto subtle encrypt. Uh, we're going to encrypt this with the initialization vector IV and the name is ASGCM. We're going to use the key we created and we're going to encode the content, which is the card details. As you saw, the card details are this like bless and K thing. So we're going to JSON stringify that and encrypt it. Um, in return, we get back ciphertext and the IV. So the ciphertext is the encrypted value and the IV is the thing we're going to, we can use in conjunction with the key to decrypt it. So it's always important to send back the IV um, in case you want to decrypt it later. Okay. So we have this. Now what we can do is what we can give to OpenAI is say, this is the card and we just give the encrypted card, use it as is. You see that? And so now very intentionally, we're giving OpenAI the encrypted card. It will never see the card. So let's call this now and see what we get. So it's gonna do it. So we got the card and check it out. This is the credit card, use it as is, ciphertext and IV. See, uh, incredible, steps finished. So we're giving it the card, but it sees some encrypted thing and without the key, it can't decrypt it. That's what we do in our application code. This boundary is so important. Good, so now we get a card. Let's use the card to buy stuff and then see how we go. So um, let's now use this. To, so we, we give the item ID and the credit card. Let's implement this function, buying product item ID, credit card. In our application, we can decrypt this and we'll decrypt it by importing decrypt from decrypt like that. 
Um, and guess what? Guess what? Decrypt is literally, we take an encrypted thing and the key, and from the encrypted thing, meaning ciphertext and IV, we parse it and we crypto subtle decrypt. It's literally, we're not rolling our own, okay? So we decrypt. So now we get the credit card as a string from the LLM, but this is the encrypted credit card because that's all it knows. And then in our application, we decrypt it, buy the thing and report to the LLM. So um, buying product here, we decrypt the credit card. This is console log, this is our application code. And we'll say product bought with the credit card. In your response, include the credit card details, okay? just to see that we will never get the actual credit card details. Cool. So now we have an end-to-end -end cycle. Let's take a quick look. And so step one, done. We got the credit card. Now it's going to buy. Buying product, 456. Decrypted card. This is our application code, which is indeed bless in K, 53, whatever. Steps finished. Product bought with credit card. In your response, include the credit card details. So step finished. This is the end. The product ID 456 has been successfully purchased a credit card with user 123. And so it's, it just doesn't know what the credit... So we did an end-to-end -end censorship cycle where the LLM never saw what we didn't want it to see. This can, of course, apply to everything, not just credit cards. Any secure token, you want to hold the key, lock the box, give it to the LLM. LLM gives you back the box you decrypt in your application, okay? Censorship, very important. You can also, if maybe this is a little bit overkill, you can use another LLM, maybe a smaller LLM, to summarize information if you don't want to share details with the LLM. You can use censorship with like another LLM. That's another thing. But this is so useful for secure tokens. All right, we, we're on level one of our ladder. Uh, next up is local only. Um, let's So encrypting and decrypting and censoring stuff is, is very good and valuable, but that's only because we're sharing our data with some language model whom we don't know what's happening with its inputs and outputs. We don't know how OpenAI is using our data or Anthropic or some external vendor. If we run the model locally, a whole host of security issues goes away. Well, we can do that thanks to tools like Olama and VLLM. Let's look at that now. So Olama is a very powerful tool. It's like this. You just go to olama.com and download it. You can run DeepSeek and Quen and a bunch of models, um, and it just runs fully locally. Um, it's, it's, it's so fantastic. In fact, here, let's try it. So if we go to the terminal and we just do Olama run Mistral, uh, we can just do, be like, hi. Um, and it's going to look at this. That's wild. This is all just local on my machine. In fact, here, to, to prove it to you, I'll run this tool called Assytop, uh, where it shows you what's happening on your GPU and other things. And so this is Assytop. And you can see my GPU is, you know, it's like 97, 82. It's like kind of fluctuating. If I run Olama, it's just going to get maxed out. Look at this, 94. It's going to stay there for a little while. Um, sorry, I didn't submit. There we go. And so now it's as long as Olama generates, it's just going to stay at the top. It's going to go to 100. And as soon as Olama stops, you can literally see when Olama stops. Um, it's still going. It stopped. And we go back to like our 80, 70 ish. So Olama runs fully locally. And we looked at Langflow earlier on how we can build agents. Guess what? Langflow integrates with Olama. So if we go to go back to Langflow, this, this agentic flow we had, model provider can just be custom. And we can get Olama from here. And the base URL is literally localhost, localhost llama 11434. We refresh, we choose our model. I like Mistral, and I just plug in this language model right here. That's it. Look at that. We can even do tool mode, and it, it can be an actual agent. So now we go back, and we do, hi, how are you? Okay, it says, I'm just a computer program, but, but I'm here to help you. How can I assist you today? Indeed, this came from, from Mistral. Cool. It's running locally. So what does that mean? I don't need to censor anything. I just send my credit card information here because it's not sharing it with any external vendor. So cool. Um, and, and it's fully secure. However, and however, I can still, of course, see that credit card information on my computer because it's my computer. I have access to this machine. And so if anyone then gets my agent running in my machine, they can see that too. They can see the whole conversation history. Uh, even worse, if I'm running this code in some cloud somewhere, like AWS or Azure or Google, then whoever is responsible for those servers is also going to have access to its memory and they're going to be able to see stuff, right? And so that leads us to the final stop on our ladder journey, which is hardware enforced uh, security. Um, most hardware today has things called TEE, Trusted Execution Environments. Trusted execution environments are exactly what they sound like. They're almost like mini computers inside the CPU of another computer 
or of a main computer where the operating system has no access to the contents there. Nobody can read what happens in the TEEs. Um, for example, Face ID with Apple, all the memory of your face stuff, your fingerprints for Touch ID, all of that is stored in what Apple calls the secure enclave, which is a TEE, a trusted execution environment. Because of that, the there's just no access to that stuff. So how does it work? Well, it executes, it gives a little bridge to the kernel of your operating system and to your code. So you can interface with it, it has an API, but what happens in there is a complete black box. And so you could um, pass code to and from there. You could, you could have very highly quantized models do inference inside a, a secure enclave, work with secure information, give you outputs and obfuscate in between inputs and outputs. Um, but that's really extremely secure and also, nobody's going to be able to see that, right? Nobody, nobody, nobody. And so that's peak security. You can take advantage of them using a few solutions from the cloud. Specifically, AWS has AWS Nitro enclaves, um, which is just highly isolated architecture, exactly as we talked about. Azure has Azure Confidential Computing. Google has Google Cloud Confidential Computing. Um, Apple has what they call with Apple Intelligence, Apple's private compute cloud, which, you know, some would say, hey, that's an oxymoron. What do you mean private cloud? It's private because it's, privatized at the hardware level. The secure enclave fully encrypts and only deals with ciphertext, even such that the operating system's um, kernel can't see what happens in there, right? And so it's maximum security. So those are our four options here. Let me put the ladder up one more time, just so you can take a screenshot or whatever. No security at all. Censorship, local only. You could even do local only and censored and hardware enforced. And of course, these are not mutually exclusive. You can combine, mix and match however you want, but these are some ways to make AI applications as secure as possible. If this has been meaningful to you, uh, share it with your friends. We want a more secure world. Share it on social media, leave a comment, like the video and subscribe to the channel. We are here to support you as developers and any feedback we get helps us do that better. So we really invite your feedback. Please remember to join our Discord, follow us on X, and be a part of the community. For now, thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.